So today I'm going to speak about windrow burning, the northern perspective. So it's, um, it's a little bit off topic for what's in the proceedings there. It was about its effectiveness on multiple weeds. Um, I really don't have a lot of data on that, but I do have a bit of experience in windrow burning and, and I've got some views on how I think it'll fit in the northern system. Um, also the paper um, in the proceedings there, a bit more about how to do it, but I think with you guys being advisors working with your clients, you're probably more interested in the technical fit rather than the mechanics of it. So anyway, we'll get into it. So what, what, what the hell is windrow burning, I suppose? And look, it's certainly more than just creating photo opportunities where you can get some lovely pics like this or, or just simply being able to burn stuff for good reason, so, which a lot of us probably like doing deep down. Windrow burning is just one of a suite of tools which are being coined the harvest weed, weed seed management tools. What is harvest weed seed management? Well, it's as the name suggests. It's about managing weed seeds at harvest. Okay, so it only works in conjunction with existing good crop agronomy practices, um, rotation, crop competition and stuff like that. It's just about managing weed seeds at harvest. And, um, and it's really probably come about ultimately for managing herbicide resistance. Um, there's a number of tools in this suite. As I said, windrow burning is just one of them. Um, some of the other ones that we've got is things like the Harrington Seed Destructor, I'm sure you've all heard of, chaff carts, the Glenbar baling system, and more recently chaff lining or windrow rotting. Um, I don't know that we've really settled on the exact name of it, but they're all aimed at managing harvest weed seeds or weed seeds present at harvest, okay, and, um, and preventing them competing or entering the seed bank. This is just a little diagram, it's a bit of agronomy 101, it's just going back to what we, I suppose we call a weed cycle. And it's just what you as advisors or I do um, or used to do each week. You start with a crop with weeds, you spray, you kill the susceptible weeds in that population, in that crop, that paddock. But you ultimately always have some survivors or some remnants or, or ones that are left there to set seed. Some of them are just simply uh, they were missed at spraying, they were late germinators, but certainly some of them are actually the resistant individuals. Okay? They live to set seed and they return to the seed bank. That's how resistance develops. Resistance doesn't develop because you spray the weeds, resistance only develops and gets worse because you allow them to multiply out year after year. Harvest weed seed management's only about this, intercepting this last step. So it's only to complement everything else that we're doing and talk about today and other times. This is just a little, um, a little uh, table here, won't spend too much time on it, but it's just looking at, uh, well, four of the key harvest weed seed management tools, um, particularly windrow burning, chaff carts, Harrington seed destructors. Of those three, they're all being shown through trial work to be equally as effective as each other at managing annual ryegrass. Um, tram, tram tracking is probably still questionable. There's definitely differences in pricing though. As you move up from windrow burning, they get progressively dearer and as does your ongoing management cost in a number of, you know, in, in some calculations. There's certainly some differences in its effect on ground cover and what that might do to our fallow efficiency in our region, in our environment. Um, and there's some labour implications. The fact is though, is that windrow burning is relatively the one with the easiest level of entry. It's cheap to establish, cheap to get into, and it's a good sounding ground to give harvest weed seed management a go for us and prove the concept in our environment. So what is narrow windrow burning or how does it operate? Um, it's pretty simple. We simply start before harvest and fit a shoot to the back of the header. That shoot's designed to collect the whole chaff stream, the whole trash stream off the header, okay, and deposit it in a narrow windrow which drops out the back. Then when you come to harvest, you go into harvest that paddock, you must harvest lower to ensure that you get those weed seeds in that header front. Because once you get them in that header front, they can only go one of two places. Number one is into the tank and they off they go to town and you get paid for it. Number two, they go into this windrow. Okay, the windrow sits there through the rest of the fallow period. Then we come back in the autumn and we just burn just the windrows. And it's that fire that sterilises that seed and renders it, um, you're not able to compete uh, with the following crop or complete that weed cycle, okay, going forward. 
And that's ultimately windrow burning, the technique. Um, they must be narrow windrows. They certainly always thought, oh, well, you know, well, I can just spread all my chaff and do a late full-scale burn or simply drop the spinners off and make a wide windrow. It's, an, it's essential that you get in a narrow windrow because you've got to achieve a critical temperature and duration of that fire to kill that seed. In those wider rows or a broad-scale burn, you just don't achieve that. So why, why are we looking at it? This is some um, results from a recent herbicide resistance survey that we ran in our region. We took in weed seeds um, after the 2013 harvest or during the 2013 harvest. These are the ryegrass results. James touched on this at the introduction today, but what it said was that not one ryegrass sample that came in there was completely susceptible. In other words, they were resistant. Every single one was resistant to at least one thing. Worse still though, multiple resistance was common. What I mean by that, it was resistant to more than one group, okay? So 19% were resistant to two herbicide groups or subgroups and so on. If I add up those bottom four, that means that we got 54% of those sample populations that came in were resistant to the four or more herbicide groups or subgroups. So we're running out of options to control a lot of our ryegrass populations. So we're getting pushed this way. So does it work? This is some work of Peter Newman out of um, Western Australia. And what he did uh, back in the early noughties, he selected, um, I think, 20 focus paddocks. And he's followed them over the last um, 13 or 14 years and mapped them for their, um, their ryegrass population that's planting. There's two lines on this. He's um, grouped them into two broad groups. The top line is where growers simply used herbicides to control their weeds. They've been very successful. This, this graph went off up here, like in the 1,000 plants per square metre. They were very successful with some diligent use and wise use of herbicides. They got those numbers down, but it certainly there's no denying it seems to have sort of plateaued there, if not starting to turn up slightly there, somewhere around that five plants per square metre. Okay? In contrast, the second line is where growers used herbicides wisely and diligently, but they integrated some form of harvest weed seed management, mostly windrow burning, some chaff carting. And you can see there a good straight line decline in your numbers. Took some time, but by 2008 they'd bottom out and they've floated around zero to one plant per square metre okay, on annual ryegrass. So it's been terribly effective for them in their environment with their weeds. So for me personally, I think um, I, I take a lot of value in the fact that it works for them in Western Australia and I don't think we're a great deal of difference in northern New South Wales, but what I challenge is how adaptable is it to our weeds, to our environment and our farming systems. That's really, to me, is the question um, today. So for harvest weed seed management to work, we've actually got to capture it in the, the front of the header. Okay, you've got to harvest low to make sure you get them in there, but they've got to set seed over a critical height, so you've got a chance of getting them over the cutter bar. This is some work by Michael Witterick and his team. So this is out of northern New South Wales, looking at a range of weeds in, in three key crops for us there. And what we're looking for is these high levels of seed above harvest height. And they will indicate the plants that, that have got potential to manage with harvest seed weed, weed seed management. We've got a cap capacity to capture them in the front. So wild oats, turnip weed, African turnip, things like bladderketnia though, 25%, probably not a good candidate. There's a couple of other ones there though that I might point out, sow thistle and milk, um, sow thistle and flea bane. Although they hold their seed above cutter bar height, I don't know that they're a good target for us. Two reasons. Number one, they're quite a mobile aerial seeder, so they may have even seeded out before the header gets there, or certainly once the reel hits, there's a good chance they'll get away. The other thing is they've got every chance to actually re-sprout and regrow post-harvest, set seed anyway. Okay, so they're not going to be good good um, targets for us. The other thing is not only holding that seed above seed height, or cutter bar height, sorry, it's about them retaining that seed and holding it on long enough for the header to get there. So obviously, you know, the, the first thing that anybody says, oh, what about wild oats in the northern region? Surely they're going to shatter out. This is some work by Michael Walsh and Stephen Powells uh, in Western Australia again on their populations, not ours. Um, and it's looking at their four kiwis, ryegrass, brome, wild oats and wild radish. Okay, and what's happened to their seed retention over time. 
So while radish holds onto it very good, even 30 days out, we've still got about 80% retention. Uh, annual ryegrass, the second one, probably 70 something percent retention after 30 days, after crop maturity. Um, brome grass and, and wild oats are these bottom lines. Wild oats, no surprise, is sliding away. But I must admit, that's not as bad as what I would have thought. Even after 30 days, it's not a good number, but you've still got 40% retention. So on the basis of this data, it would suggest there is some opportunity for black oats, but timeliness, as in everything in farming, is going to be of the essence for black oats. Um, on the basis of that data, they calculated seed shed at around about 0.8 to 1.5% per day. So every day you leave it, you lose a bit more seed on the ground, so it's going to become less effective on those shedding varieties. Of course, wild oats is the big number. So I guess the other question is, is what about our wet summers? So we get summer rainfall. Western Australia is very much a Mediterranean climate, doesn't get a lot of summer rainfall. Is that going to affect its applicability and um, operation in our region? Now certainly we had a lot of growers in our region start windrow burning last year. Couldn't have been a worse year to start windrow burning. Started raining in March and rained for a month straight and we all started to panic. One thing that it was proved to me though last year, after having done this for three years myself, is that I've got great confidence that we only need 10 or 14 days of dry weather to get those windrows to dry out sufficiently to get them burning out and burn out to the ground level to kill that weed seed. Okay? Worst case scenario, we need three or four days to dry the stubble fraction out, so the heavy bulky material, to burn that so that it, you can basically go through and seed that crop without any blockages. Okay? Not going to be great on the weeds, but it's not going to stop you sowing that crop. Okay? So I really don't think, you know, with a bit of forward planning and, um, and having yourself organised, um, that you're going to get caught out not being able to burn windrows because of our wet summers. Incidentally, that's a windrow, just at the, the tail end of a windrow, that's actually on April 26th, I was sowing that paddock to canola and um, you know that was just one that I lit up, it had volunteer barley hanging out the side, it was wet, it rained the day before and it's burnt out perfectly. It was a very big crop though. What else about our wet summers? Well I honestly think that I think, I think our wet summers actually give us an advantage over the Western Australians. With our summer rainfall, it's got the potential to actually knock off the basil leaf that hangs on the bottom of the barley stubble. And also that summer rainfall does have the potential to drive the breakdown of that leaf litter on the ground. It's that basil leaf and that leaf litter that's the tinder. That's what makes fires take off or allows fires to burn off between rows. Um, and um, with our summer rainfall, knocking that down and seeing that break down, we lose the flammability in our stubble. So I think summer rainfall actually gives us some, some advantage over the Western Australians. So this is a bit tongue in cheek, but I guess the other one that gets levelled is what about um, large crops? You know, everybody says, oh, that's in Western Australia. They ain't, you know, only grow a tonne to the hectare, you know, like they talked about this morning. Uh, we grow much bigger crops than that here, you know, so that's why we can't do it. Um, look, there's no doubt, there's, I'm not challenging it, that the lighter crops, the one with the less trash, the la less residue, are certainly much easier to, to burn uh, and safer to burn. That lower residue minimises the chance of fire escape, the, um, the less trash for the head of the handle, so there may be less uh, effect on your harvesting efficiency. And often that crop's shorter, so there's a better chance of being able to capture those weed seeds um, anyway. And just as a bit of a guide, I suppose, a bit of a hierarchy of what crops you might like to attack first. And there's a bit more information in this in the paper in the, in the proceedings, but certainly things like chickpeas. I think for chickpea growers in the northern region, if you're not windrow burning your chickpeas, you're missing a free spin. You're already dragging the comb on the ground. There's no stubble left to, to try and save. Um, and chickpeas are probably one of our dirtiest crops. If you're not windrow burning, your chickpeas, you're missing a great opportunity. But certainly chickpeas are a great option. Things like lupins, canola, I'm not quite so sure about in our region. Certainly Western Australians talk about it. Um, but you then move into our lower yielding cereals. From there, you start moving into our high yielding cereals and of course, barley. Okay, so that's a general hierarchy, but I do stress, 
don't think of this as a tool that you only can use in those lower yielding or break crops. Um, I haven't burned a wheat crop under three tonne to the hectare um, and there's plenty of commentary and YouTube videos and stuff coming out of the West now about people over there burning you know, three and four tonne to the hectare wheat crops quite comfortably. But that comes with experience um, and skill, but it's certainly um, able to be done. So that's just, um, I suppose that's, a, that's that barley crop I showed you a photo of a minute ago. This is the main season burn where I did. Um, and that was quite a significant barley crop. And you can see there that certainly tried to escape in a number of spots there. But for the most part, that paddock is still pretty well intact. So it's achievable. I guess the other thing for us, um, in contrast to Western Australians, we run tram lines and we're generally in wider row spacings. I can't help but think dropping a windrow down the middle between those two tram line, bare tram lines, doesn't give you some safety in these miniature fire breaks running up either side of that tram line and also those wider rows give less chance for that fire to escape as well. So I think that's just another little uh, intricacy of our systems that, um, that could improve the, uh, the fit for us. So I guess the question is, does it work? There's, there's a couple of photos here that I really just put up to firstly illustrate the potential of the header to capture that weed seed into this windrow. Now this, uh, that's all ryegrass there. This is sown to canola here. Um, and that basically just demonstrates the capacity of that header to bring those weed seeds in, the capacity to capture those weed seeds. What was missing here is an adequate burn, which I'll talk about in a minute. But that very um, principle there is something that the Western Australians have actually picked up and have started to run with. Now this is chaff lining or windrow rotting. Um, as I said, we're not quite sure on the actual terminology that we're going to use, but in this situation, they simply pull the chaff off. They still spread the straw out. They pull the chaff off and they drop it in your wheel tracks. Okay? It's just simply dropped in the wheel tracks. It's left there. It's not burnt. It's not, there's nothing further done with it. Okay? And they're just relying on this isolation factor um, to, you know, it's basically a bit of prescription farming. You put all your troubled weeds on your worst bit of ground in the paddock, on the tram lines, and they're relying on that competition, compaction, or even interweed competition to, to limit the effect. It's only going to compete with the, their, their weeds or a very small percentage of your, your crop. So there's certainly potential in that. I hazard a warning, though, is that I personally can't think of any better place to breed resistance than spraying herbicides on a situation like that. Very high numbers of most likely resistant individuals in compacted zones. Um, not a great place to be, but it's worth at least pursuing and, and looking at a bit deeper. This is just another photo. This is um, east of Narromine a few years ago. They actually went to the trouble of windrowing it, but they never actually put a match in it. Um, but even then, um, you can see the level of ryegrass all the way through there. That's Roundup Ready canola. It hasn't had any herbicide applied to that paddock yet at all. And I think that picture again demonstrates the capacity for that technique to pull those weeds in to that windrow, um, ready for you to deal with. But again, it's about killing them with the fire. And this is the critical part. Up until this point, it's pretty well child's play. It's pretty simple stuff. Um, burning it is the most critical part of it. Okay, if you don't get the burn right, um, it has the potential to really undo a lot of good work up until that stage. But it's not the end of the world, I might add. So this one's now south of Narromine, um, where they've got a pretty handy burn here, and you can see there they've got a pretty good kill on that level of ryegrass. But the cluey ones in the, in the room would say, oh, but Murray, look at all the ryegrass and the rest of the paddock. That ryegrass is not from last year, or it's not from that stubble, it's from the year before. If I, I should have put it in there, but I've got a picture of the, the paddock next door um, that didn't get windrowed and it's just a write-off. You can barely pick the weed in it. Okay, so it's very effective at reducing this, but they didn't get the whole paddock right. This is at the other side of the paddock. Assumedly, assumedly the conditions probably declined. So this is your windrow here, and you can see that level of control dropping off and off there in the distance. I'd suggest it probably hasn't done a great deal for you. Okay? So getting those conditions right are absolutely paramount. I won't 
go into it much today unless you wanted, uh, want me to go into it, but there's a bit of detail in the paper about getting that right. So what about potential issues? Well, I guess there's always a case with whatever you do, you know, nature will find a way around it, okay? So if we continue to rely on windrow burning, just windrow burning, there's every chance that we may see some shift in weed species or weed characteristics. Will we select for early shedding blackcoats? Possibly. Will we select for prostate ryegrass? Yes, we will. Will we start cleaning up our ryegrass populations and start selecting for or seeing resistance develop in, I don't know, ground dwellers like um, wireweed or something or other like that. So we will see that, but it is a useful tool on those key problematic weeds. Um, there's big questions over what the impact on our fallow efficiency is, okay? So there's no doubt that we're shifting a lot of dry matter that we traditionally harvested, redistributed over the paddock. We're now shifting that from out there to that distinct windrow area and lessening that ground cover there. What impact that has on our fallow efficiency is probably yet to be seen. Um, look, we've we had five trials in last year and we've got more trials in again this year. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to report on that next year for you guys. But I will suggest, um, I'll hesitate from telling you what we found last year, but I will, I will say that windrow burning is not going to destroy fallow efficiency. You're not going to wreck it completely. We're only talking about a fraction of re reduction on that fallow efficiency, okay? So it's a cost and it's a cost that we have to bear, but weed control has always cost us money. Okay, we've always had to pay for hoe grass or, or topical or whatever. We may be just paying for it in a different way. So definitely a concern, uh, watch this space. What about nutrient redistribution? So Western, Australia's, the Western Australians are growing in sandy soils, mm -hmm. um, low in potassium. They're transporting their stubble from external to the windrow into the windrow with all the potassium. Um, and they're leaving this area out here deficient and that potassium takes some expense to actually replace. Okay, there's some other nutrient involved, but when you look at it on a cost base, it's the other ones are quite minor, it's the potassium. With our heavy clay soils, we won't be worrying about that for, you know, years to come, years and years to come, okay? So I don't think that'll be a big thing, um, but I guess the other thing is, it's probably not a bad practice if you are able to shift your windrows each year so that you're not putting them on the same spot continuously each year anyway. And certainly there's, there's questions over increased labour and costs. Um, just another job to do and stuff like that. Um, but as I said, you know, we've always had to put effort into control weeds. We used to sit on a plough. We used to sit on a boom spray. Um, now we might have to run around with a box of matches and burn some windrows instead. So um, that's a bit of a light-hearted look. But look, like I said, weed control has always cost us money. So in summary, it's certainly proven to work in WA. The question is about the transfer into our northern system. I'm pretty positive that I think it's got some fit here. It's not gonna be for everyone, every paddock and every location, but I think it will. Um, it's gonna tackle a lot of our, like my region's problem weeds, maybe not yours, um, but, um, but not all of them. We've got some troublesome ones there in Flea Bane and South Thistle, they're not gonna address. And of course, we still, you know, the elephant in the room is what do we do with our fallow weeds and glyphosate resistant there. It's not going to handle them. Um, I really think our weather, our summer rainfall is actually to our advantage. I don't see it's a disadvantage at all. So it's overall suitability. Well, basically time and experience will tell. You need to start, I, I urge you to start considering it, having a bit of a play with it. And, um, and it's only that way that we'll probably be able to see whether it fits or not. And the other thing that I'd suggest is prevention is better than cure. Okay, so for some of those populations of ours and some of those Western Australian growers, a lot of them have no, opportun no options left. Okay, this is one of the few things we've got left. Fussing around on rotations and crop choice and all that are very, um, they're not, they're not gonna give us the answers we need. Um, because it breaks, if you think back to that, that earlier chart where it was that return of those survivors to the seed bank, okay, it's got the chance to intercept that development of resistance and prevent that resistance developing. So it does have the potential to actually prolong the useful life of the herbicides you've got. 
So don't wait till you've got a problem. Um, use it ahead and, um, and keep some of your products working. Now going back to John's original charter for today is about it working on multiple weeds. Look, I don't have a lot of data on it or anything like that, but really at the end of the day, there's no reason why it can't work on multiple weeds. It's really just a question of seed height and retention and their, their maturity. If they all tend to match up, there's no reason why you can't, uh, it won't work on multiple weed species. Um, just a bit of a shameless plug there. We did do a YouTube video a number of years ago, which did look at this and some of those key issues. Um, I urge you to go and have a look at it. And there is another one there, um, just to have a bit of a look at it and it might um, give you a bit more confidence. And I guess the last thing is just to acknowledge um, GRDC support of Goa being able to do this work. They're our, uh, they're our only sponsors and without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Thank you.